I love MCP servers. They are incredibly powerful for AI coding. But last week, I discovered that they were secretly destroying my AI coding workflow the entire time. And this trap causes you to hit rate limits faster, burn through API credits unnecessarily. And here's what really got me. It makes your AI way worse at understanding your code base. Now, this doesn't just cost us all money and time. It's actively sabotaging our AI's ability to think and help you while you actually have the illusion that you're giving it more capabilities. So by the end of this video, Video, you'll know exactly how to escape this trap and I will prove that it reduces your token usage by showing you a real example so you can become a real AI native engineer instead of just vibe coding and trying to add a bunch of MCP tools that actually harm your AI coding systems. To show you what I mean, I wanted to share a personal story of mine because I encountered this exact situation last week. Basically, I was working on my AI engineering tutor application and I create all of my code changes in GitHub. So here in GitHub, you can see that I've got all of my code and I push code to the main branch with pull requests. Of course, I also use actions to automatically push code to both the backend infrastructure as well as the frontend infrastructure. So I figured, hey, if I connect my AI code tool to my GitHub repository, then I'm able to, for example, create pull requests automatically, which is very cool. To do that, I'm using the GitHub MCP server and you can connect MCP servers with any AI code tool of your choice, right? So let's actually show this example here. If I go to Visual Studio Code and I type in Codex, I'm opening OpenAI Codex like so. And then if I type slash MCP, you will actually see that I've got that GitHub MCP server connected. And there are a bunch of tools that you get access to, like being able to add a comment to an issue or of course, creating a pull request. So for example, now I can ask, get the latest issue from the repo. And it will know which repo it should call because it understands how to read, you know, the Git metadata that's in my folder right now. So because I've got that MCP tool installed, Codex is smart enough and understands that it can actually call this specific tool set to retrieve all the issues in my repository. So if we just give it a second, you will see that it indeed calls this tool GitHub list issues, and it's able to find one issue. I actually just got started on this repository, so I still need to track more issues, but you can see that the tool itself does work. The problem is though, we are already using 13,000 tokens. And let's say that I want to ask another very trivial question, like what was the status of the latest action workflow run? It will again be able to call the MCP tool without any issue, but it will use a bunch of tokens. You can now see that it calls list workflow runs and it is able to find the latest run where I'm deploying our Docker image. And it can just continue to iterate on that and just get more information about the latest workflows. So, you know, it all works very well and the MCP server is super functional. But the problem is our token usage is just increasing every single time that we call this MCP server. And the problem is as the conversation goes on, we are going to easily fill our context and I'm not even asking any questions about my code. I'm just asking it to perform some trivial read operations on my, my repository, right? If I now go and type slash status, we can actually see the usage of our current session. You can see here that we have quite a lot of input tokens. And actually, we ended up using a lot more tokens than that OpenAI actually showed here on the bottom. And the reason for that is that it does actually cache a lot of the input tokens. So what you see here on the top, all of these tools and their definitions, those tokens are cached. So if you're using the API, you don't pay as much for them as for regular tokens. And you're not going to hit rate limits as quickly as with normal tokens when you're using a subscription plan plan. But still, even though they're cached, it still counts towards your rate limits. And you can be sure that if you're using more than 100,000 cash tokens in such a small conversation already, that this adds up very quickly. Now, before I show you the solution to this problem, I want to point out that this is not just about cost optimization. These tokens are expensive, even if they're cached, but they also might result the language model in not being able to understand or focus on your code as much. You have to imagine that if you give it thousands of irrelevant tokens, then the attention span for your actual code content will be a lot lower. All of these tokens that you spent explaining to the language model what MCP tools it can call could have been better spent on just providing more code files. Look at this example here. This is the code file that I use to interact with my database. And it actually achieves quite a lot to my application and it gives great context as to how the application interacts with the database. And if we look at how many lines of code this is, it's over 300. That is definitely 
a lot of code. That's a that's a full class definition, right? Now, if I go ahead and copy this entire code and I paste it in a tokenizer, I will get an idea of how many tokens all of this code really is. So if I paste it in here, you will actually see that it's 2,258 tokens. Compared to all of those MCP tool calls, that's actually not much at all. And in fact, if you repeatedly input this code file, it will also be cached just like those MCP tool calls. So when you realize that we spent over 100,000 tokens on MCP tool definitions, we could have had like 40 different code files of this size in our context as well. Which do you think is more useful? A bunch of MCP tool definitions that your language model will not use anyway, or more context about the code base that actually helps your AI perform better? Well, the choice is up to you, but I can tell you which one is actually more effective. So how do you actually make sure that you reduce the number of MCP tools that you have while still keeping all of this connectivity with external platforms like GitHub? Well, let's have a look at how I personally solve that. I've seen people rant about, you know, how their Claude Max plan is only letting them code for a couple of hours at a time. And I'm gonna be honest, I've not experienced that issue at all because I don't use a bunch of MCP servers that I don't actually need. What you really should be doing is evaluating the MCP servers that you're currently using in your configuration and figure out which ones you don't need. Because what might surprise you is that there are alternative ways to achieve the exact same thing. Now, what I have done is I've actually removed the GitHub MCP server from my codex configuration. And now if I open a new codex window and I type slash MCP, you will see that there are no tools configured. So how do I actually interact with my GitHub repo without an MCP server? Well, GitHub already has a CLI tool that interacts with the REST API. So I can, for example, say, get all the issues from my repo open and closed. And then what it will do again is it will do a similar query as what it did with the MCP server, but using way fewer tokens. So now you will actually see that it needs to get some permission to actually run this. So I'm gonna go ahead and approve that command. And now it will get all of the GitHub issues with a gh issue list command. So I'm going to go ahead and keep approving because I've never approved these tools before. And then once it actually runs this, you will see that that exact same issue that we retrieved before is present here as well. So you can see here that it's trying to view the details of issue number one because it actually found that that ID exists. So we're going to go ahead and accept that. And then once it's done with that, you will see that it comes back with a result. So there you go. Now we exactly have the semantic FAQ caching issue again, and we only used 5,000 tokens. Crucially, if I now type slash status, and you can already see that we're using way fewer tokens. We only have 4,000 input tokens with 15,000 cache tokens. Now, to be fair, we only asked about that issue. So let's also ask it about the workflow, just like we did in the other chat. So back here, I'm just gonna go ahead and copy this. So we asked the exact same question retrieve the latest workflow run from my repo. And again, it will just call the GitHub CLI for this. And now you can indeed see that we have a run here, try Sonnet again for faster inference. And if I go ahead and try and find that in the other window, you will indeed see that the other instance found this as well. Now, what's interesting about this, of course, is that if we look at our token usage again with slash status, we actually only used 9,000 input tokens and 25,000 cash tokens for a total of 10,000 if we also include all of the outputs. Let's compare that with the other session that we just had, which uses the MCP servers. On the other session, you can see that we use a total of 31,000 input tokens with over 100,000 cash tokens. And this is a conversation of just two turns. If you talk for a long time with these AI agents, you're going to burn so many more tokens just because you're using these MCP servers. So how do you use these MCP servers effectively? Well, one thing that's very important is that you don't always have to include them depending on what kind of work you're doing. For example, if you know that you're using Codex to do the actual coding work, then you could, for example, not have a GitHub MCP server at all. And instead, you can connect the MCP server to a different session that you always use at the end of your workday, for example 
example, to commit all of your changes. Let me show you one example of how I actually do that. So in my work, I like to actually have a look at how my latest YouTube videos are doing and trying to come up with new video ideas for you guys. And the way that I do that is not with Codex or Claude Code because I'm using those tools to you know, develop software and provide demos for you guys. What I actually do for that is use Claude Desktop, which is a nice you know, separate user interface that is much nicer to just brainstorm with. So in Cloud Desktop, if I ask a question like, fetch my latest YouTube video, you will actually see that Claude goes and uses an MCP server to achieve that. As you can see, fetch my latest YouTube video results in a get channel call. And then you can indeed see that here's my channel and it actually goes ahead and fetches the latest video. So that creates it. In this case, the Git workflow that fixes broken code, which is absolutely correct at the moment that I'm recording this video. So this is an example where I always expose my YouTube MCP server to Claude Desktop. It's worth it because I actually use Claude Desktop to brainstorm new video ideas. It would be a complete waste of tokens to enable that MCP server as well for Codex because I never want Codex to ever call my YouTube videos. So keeping track of the MCP servers that you use across all of your different AI tools is super important. Now here are some simple steps for you to get the most out of your MCP server configuration. First of all, have a look at your current config and delete servers that you do not use anymore. In my case, I only consistently use a couple of servers like Contact7 and Serena. Secondly, for the servers that you do use, make sure that you evaluate whether you need all of them on a per project and per tool basis like I've done with Codex and Claude. And the last step is to actually consider whether you even need MCP servers for some of the things that you are doing. You would be surprised at how much you can achieve with using terminal tools like the GitHub CLI instead of passing all of these MCP servers to your AI agents. So with all of those tools combined, you will have a much better AI coding workflow. And if you're ready to become a real AI native engineer, then you should check out the link in the description below because this is just the start of your journey to become more efficient, build real AI systems and future-proof yourself. So you can join us in a community and learn faster instead of watching these videos alone. I hope to see you there.